When Jesus was on his way back out of hell, and he was on his way to the Father, he made a stop off at the tomb because he figured there would probably be somebody standing around there crying. (laughs) And lo and behold, he found Mary, and she's looking for Jesus. Well, he looks like the gardener, so she doesn't recognize him because that's what happens when we get resurrected. We get changed. We get transformed. There's a metamorphosis that occurs. And so when he sees Mary, she grabs a hold of him. And Jesus then says probably one of the most profound things that he ever said while he was on this earth. And here it is in John 20, verse number 17. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me. I have not yet gone to my father because Jesus was getting ready to present himself as the spotless lamb to his father, the, the lamb that, of God that takes away the sin of the world. And, but this is what he says, but go to my brothers and listen to this bit. Whoops, how did that happen? What happened there? Tell them that I will go up to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Now, I don't know whether you can comprehend that or not. I'm not sure I can, but I know Jesus is saying at least one thing. You can be like me. You can have the same things I have. You can enjoy the same privilege that I have. You can step into the same right and authority that I have. He's my father, but he can be your father too. He's my God, Jesus said, but he can be your God. And this is a profound statement that Jesus is telling his followers, you can actually have your own God, my God. I can say my God. I have the privilege to be able to call him my God. And there are vast implications of that because when the people of God are coming out of Egypt and Moses is turning around and he's looking and saying, wow, what just happened? A bunch of slaves coming out of Egypt by the power of God, walking through the Red Sea. God part of the waters. There's big walls of water. They walk out of that. Moses turns around as he watches the waters cover all their enemies, and he looks at that. He goes, wow, he is my God, and I will praise him. In other words, hey, that's my God that did that. That's my God that rescued us. That's my God that redeemed us. That's my God. David in the Psalms said it this way, through my God, I can leap over a wall. Oh, it doesn't make any difference how tall the wall is, how big the wall is, how long the wall's been there. David said, my God, because of my God, I can get over the wall. Daniel, he's sitting down in this pit all night in the dark with all these lions. And the king is wondering what has happened to him. They pull the stone back. The king looks down there in the morning and he calls down there in the dark and he says, Daniel, are, are you there? Did your God uh, help you while you were down in there? And he shouts back up to the king. And he said, King, I just want you to know one thing. My God shut the mouths of the lion. My God was the one that delivered me. My God was the one that saw my innocence. My God was the one that overruled what you tried to do to me. That's my God. Paul said it this way. Paul said it this way, my God shall supply all your need. We're not going to measure how big the need is. We're not going to worry about how long it's been there or how massive it is or how deep it is or how severe it is or how threatening it is. We're going to declare today, my God shall supply that need. That's my God. That's my God. Now I want to tell you, I'm going to say my God, but you need to say my God. I'm not going to say your God because I don't know about your God. I know about my God. And you need to know about 
my God. Right? Because there's a big difference. Because the implications of carrying around a perspective of he's my God transforms our lives. How how's that happen? Well, let's talk about some ways that happens. This is good. Ain't think about this. When you say he's my God, that's personal. That's really personal. That's special. That's unique. That's significant. That is that's my personal possession. That is unique to me. That is something that I can say because of him. Now I want you to think about this. I can say, if I'm a true follower of Jesus, I can say he's my God. Because he wants to be my God. That's all he's ever wanted to be was my God. Why? Because he knows I need a God. But I need that God. I don't need any of the other gods. Right? Because the second commandment tells us that there are plenty of other gods. You shall have no other gods. Well, if there are no other gods, how can we have other gods? You shall have no other gods. God says, listen, from the very beginning, I have wanted to be your God. The Bible says he has set his love on me before I ever knew him. He has chased me, sought me found me, bought me, redeemed me, laid hold of me when I didn't even know anything was going on. He did all of that because he chose to set his love on me. He said, I want to be your God. He wants to be my God more than I wanted him to be my God. And because he's, I can say, He's my God. He is my God regardless of what I was. He is my God regardless of what I might be at the moment. Amen. He is still my God. Thank you, Lord. Come on now. Come on. He is my God. He is my God. And He's my God because what? He has seen me as finished, done, complete, whole, perfected, and glorified since the beginning. Come on. When you look at yourself in the mirror, that's not what he's seeing. He is seeing prophetically the wholeness and the completeness and the finished product in Jesus Christ, in his image and in his likeness. This is my God. This is very personal. You see, it's a thing between him and me. It's that personal. It's not anybody else. You see, he's not the God. He's not some God. He's not their God. He's my God. He's not just somebody's God. He's my God. And there's a big difference between saying the God and saying my God. Personal. Very, very personal. Secondly, it is relational. It is relational. You say, Pastor Buddy, what do you mean by that? Well, he is not just with me. He is not just near me. He is not just close to me. He is not just around me. He is not just for me. He is actually in me. Amen. Oh, hello. Amen. He is in me. Yes. Solomon said, you know, this is an amazing thing. You know, remember we talked about how big you are on the inside? Solomon said, God, I don't know how you're even going to inhabit this little temple that we built for you that is so marvelous and so wonderful and so incredible. I don't even know how you're going to fit in here. And yet God says, no, I'm coming into you. My God is not in here. He's in here. He is in me. And I am in him. I, the, I and the Father, J Jesus said, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. There is a divine assimilation, identification, integration, inclusion, oneness, unification that comes when you can say, He is my God. Therefore, 
He is not out there. He's not up there. He's not over there. He's not in here. He's in here. He is in me. Therefore, I cannot ever biblically or truthfully ever feel isolated, alone, lost, dejected, because he's in me. I cannot feel slighted, forsaken, because he is in me. And I in him. him. And because he is in me, all that he is is in me. And because I am in him, all that I am is in him. Therefore, what I am now belongs to him. So, oh, guess what? All of my problems are now his. Because the only thing I brought into this was a bunch of junk. I brought a bunch of confusion and stuff. And all of this stuff that God's going to sort out for me and turn it around and restore my life. That's what I brought in. He goes, oh, I'll take ownership of all of that. I'll take ownership of everything that you bring in as long as you take ownership of who I am and what I can do in your life. This is totally relational. This is not about a book. This is not about a study. This is not about knowledge. This is a relational thing. He is in me. And I am in him. And that is an amazing thing. So I don't have to pray him down. I don't have to beg him to come near. He is in me right now. And his overcoming power is in me. His grace and his mercy are in me. It is totally relational. Thirdly, it's practical. I mean, it's totally practical. Because all we have to do is say two words. God rules. That's it. That's the answer to everything. God rules. Hey, you remember this? When I, when I was in high school, uh, <laughs> you'd go in the, in the boys' room, in the, the restroom, and somebody would have scribbled on one of the stalls or something, Surfers rule. Remember that? Now I'm old, so they would. And then somebody comes in there and they cross out the surfers part and they put kickers rule. Yeah. And then somebody else comes in the stall and they go, ah, that ain't right. Cross that out and they put nerds rule. And then somebody looked at that and goes, no, that cannot stand. So they cross that out and they put stoners rule. Whoa. Yeah. I mean, we had all kinds of... But you know, the truth of the matter is, none of that was right. God rules. Which means one thing for you and I. He always gets His way. He always has His way. He always goes His way. He always makes His way. God rules. And therefore, because He rules, He can do anything He wants. Now... A little proviso to that. It can be dangerous when you're serving under somebody who can do anything they want. There are some people who should never rule. What makes him so awesome is he's a good ruler. He's a gracious ruler. He's an awesome ruler. He's a faithful ruler. He is everything that he promises that he will be. So therefore, because he is not only the ruler, but he is a good ruler and an awesome ruler and a great ruler, therefore, guess what? I can trust him. Come on. Hey, it doesn't get any simpler than this. I can trust him. Flat out, I can trust him. I can trust Him with the seasons of my life, all the phases that I'm going through, because you and I go through seasons. We have seasons. We have uh, dry seasons. We have drought. We have famine. Uh, We have uh, uh, hot seasons. We have all different kinds of seasons that we go through in our life. And guess what? God has already declared the end from the beginning to those seasons, and He's going to bring the fruit out of every one of those seasons, because He has already had the first thought before I had a thought, He had a thought. Before I had a word, He had a word. Before I had a choice, He had a choice. 
before I have a determination or decision. He's already had his determinations and decisions. He has determined the end from the beginning and therefore he is ruling over all of it. You know, sometimes we act like he's not in charge. He's ruling. He's ruling over the season of life. But Pastor Buddy, that was a horrible time for me. Yes, I'm sure it was. I've had some really horrible times. Maybe we could sit down and talk about how horrible all of our times are. Or we could just declare God rules. And he is bringing my seasons to their culmination. He will bring the fruit out of every season. He will call it forth. No matter how tragic, how horrific it might be. How difficult it might be. He rules over my days, over the details of my life. You know, you got to love about God only creates good days. Genesis 1, no bad days, just good days. God only created good days. All God's days end in good. All God's days end in the light. All God's days end when he says they're going to end. And all of God's days come to all together so that he can pronounce over them, this is very good. That's what he said at the end. This is very good. I put all those days together and it's very good. So I can look back at my days and go, oh, I can't believe. And yet God says, no, I'm bringing good out of all of those days. Listen, he rules over my enemies. Oh, and by the way, because of that, you don't have to be afraid of people. David said, I don't care what people do to me. I trust in my God. I will not fear what man can do to me. There's no amount of mistreatment, no amount of abuse, no amount of, of, of harshness, no amount of injustice, no amount of... You see, when people don't realize that God is ruling over their lives and they're not trusting Him, they get sidetracked with unfairness. They get sidetracked with things that are happening to them. I got to fix this. I got to make it right. They did me wrong. I got to make it right. No, God rules. He rules over my enemies. No matter what the assault, no matter what the attack, no matter what it is, no matter hard, how, how hard and fast it comes, He rules over my enemies. He has already declared the victory over my enemies. Whatever it is, it's that practical. It's that practical. You know, this would save us a lot of heartache and a lot of sweat. Just to get up in the morning and say, Thank you, God, you rule. You rule. He's my God. This is my God. Now, if you don't have my God, you're in trouble. Because there's only one God that rules. You've got to have my God. And he's got to be able, you've got to be able to say, my God. Let me give you one more. He's confrontational. He's my God. That's confrontational. Have you ever noticed how God loves a showdown? I mean, he loves a good scrap. He does. He loves a good fight. The Bible is a book full of showdowns. He absolutely loves a showdown. In fact, God will engineer and work things in such a way to cause a showdown. He is looking for a fight. He is. This is why the Bible says uh, Moses said God's a man of war. Why is he a man of war? Because he's looking for a showdown. You know what a showdown is? A showdown is the final test to settle the dispute once and for all. Once and for all. Not this and that. Not that. No, once and for all. That's what a showdown is. And the Bible is absolutely full of showdowns because God loves a showdown. In fact, God loves a showdown because He is my God and He doesn't want any other gods around me. He doesn't want any other gods in me. And He will serve and come as a sh- at a showdown and say, Look, we're going to go forward, but you can't have that. And so God brings a showdown. Now watch. When they came out of Egypt, that was not merely a contest between some slaves and a powerful Pharaoh. That was a showdown. That was a showdown between the gods of Egypt and my God. That's what that was. And I want to tell you, Pharaoh had nothing in that showdown. When David came out against Goliath, this was not just a contest between a man and a giant. 
This was a showdown between the gods of the Philistines and the eternal God of heaven and earth. That was a showdown. And Goliath had nothing. When Elijah was up on top of the mountain, on Mount Carmel with all those crazy... You know, when people don't follow Jesus, they get nuts. I mean, turn the TV on. In any city you want, those people are absolutely stark raving mad. You know why? Because they don't have Jesus. These, these prophets are up there on the mountain with, with Elijah, and he's just standing there watching them. They're cutting themselves and running around and trying everything to get their God to respond to them. This was not merely a contest between a true prophet and a bunch of false prophets. This was a showdown. And it was a showdown of the gods of Baal against the God of gods. Elijah's God. And Baal had nothing. When the ark went and they dropped the ark in front of Dagon in the temple of Dagon. Now you got to keep in mind this is on Dagon's home court. Dagon has home field advantage. God said, I don't care. I'm ready for a showdown. Bring the ark. They set it down in front of there. Came back the next day. Dagon had fallen over. Pick him back up. Set him up. Next day they come in there. Dagon's fallen over and his hands are, have been cut off by the power of the ark. This was not a contest between a sacred box and a golden idol. This was a showdown between the gods of the Philistines and the God of gods. When Jesus went into hell for you and me, I mean, next time you grouse at him, you might hear him say, hey, listen, man, I went to hell for you, so just... Seriously, I'm going to tell him my problems. When he went to hell, this was not just a contest between the sun and a bunch of fallen angels. This was a showdown between the gods of this world and the God of all creation, of heaven, earth, and hell. And the devil had nothing, just like Dagon had nothing, and Goliath had nothing, and Pharaoh had nothing, and Baal had nothing. Nobody has anything when it comes to my God. So with my God, it is not just my physical body against some autoimmune disease. It is not just your body against some sort of diagnosis. We're talking about a showdown here. This is a showdown between that disease and my God. And that disease has nothing in the face of my God. With my God, it is not just about my family, my marriage, my life versus the challenges and threats and adversities, and attacks. It's not just a contest there. It is a showdown between the devourer and the Lord my God. And the devourer has nothing. He has nothing in the face of my God. This is not just a contest. All of this is a showdown. And it is designed for God himself to declare how immeasurably strong and powerful and awesome and gracious and incredible he is. And so today, I think God is saying to us, let me show you what it means to have your own God like that. You see, everybody has a God. Already. The reason you know that is because everybody is created to worship and for worship. And so if you, have a, if you are a worshiper, you have to have something to worship. And so everybody has their own God. The only difference between somebody who declares, He is my God, and something else, is you've just changed your gods and gotten the real one. That's what happened. I always have had a God. Now I have Him. I have the real one. I have the God of gods. He is my God. But everybody has 
a God. And guess what you can do? You can lay yours aside and embrace my God today. I want to ask you just to bow your head with me. Just right there, just very quickly, I want you to bow your head with me. And I want you to just think about this today. You may need because today is showdown day. You may need to lay down a lesser God. You may need to lay down your own intellect. Pastor Buddy, this is my way of doing life. This is these are my ideas. These are my answers. This is my intention. This is a way I'm figuring out life on my own. But I can tell you today, my God is your remedy. You may need to lay down your own strength in trying to cope with what someone has done to you what's happened to you, what you've been through, or even what you're facing right now. Because I want to tell you today that my God is your refuge. You may need to lay down your own reality, which can be difficult. Whatever the issue, the infirmity, the affliction, the addiction, the diagnosis, whatever is looming larger in your life right now than my God, because my God is your restorer. He's your healer. Can you say it truthfully? Honestly, biblically, he's my God. Or is there something that needs to be laid down, laid aside? Jesus said, quite a few people will come to him in the end and say, You're my God. And Jesus will say, I never knew you. God, today, my God, is ready for a showdown. You bring that issue and watch what my God will do. Bring that affliction. Bring that unfairness. That injustice. That tragedy. That abusive situation. Because my God is a redeemer. Or maybe you've been trying to figure out your life. No one does life alone. It's impossible. And I can tell you firsthand what everybody else in the room would tell you as well. You need my God to do that. You need my God to do life.